Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Veterans Voices. Tonight, we are talking about violence prevention. We have a thought-provoking show ahead, so stay tuned. Welcome to Veterans Voices. I'm Nathan Johnson, and my co-host is Aaron Escare. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Welcome to you and all our viewers tonight. Absolutely. Veterans Voices is a monthly television show that explores the important issues that affect the veterans community. We also hope to connect vets and their families to supportive resources and events. We encourage you to participate in the conversation tonight. In fact, we need you in as part of this conversation. If you have stories or would like to share or ask a question, please send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One. Email at Veterans Voices at ContraCostaTV.org, or you can call us at 925 313 1170. Our phone lines are open right now. We'd love to hear from you. Tonight, we are honoring a very special veteran named Tech Sergeant Camila Asuncion, who entered the Air Force in 2002. She was assigned to Travis Air Force Base and worked in aviation resource management. She deployed in 2004 and 2005, earning an Air Force Expeditionary Service Ribbon for her support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. She eventually became an Equal Opportunity Specialist, helping to ensure all personnel are treated with dignity and respect. She is an airman that has truly embodied the Air Force core values, integrity, first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. Camilla, we know that you're tuning in tonight, and from your Veterans Voices family, we want to tell you well wishes to you and your family. This evening on a special Veterans Voices, we are leaving our traditional focus on the veterans community to talk about an issue that affects everyone, all of us, me and you. Violence is a part of every community. And tonight we will have in-depth conversations about the roots of violence and talk about things we can do to help prevent violence in our own communities and in our lives. Our first guests, Dr. Jeffrey Kicks Miller and JTB Cool, are experienced in helping people cope with violent thoughts and feelings. Before I introduce them, I'd like to mention that this conversation can be very triggering for some people who have experienced violence. I encourage those who are triggered by this conversation to seek comfort and seek support. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, before we dive into the conversation, lots to talk about tonight. Give us our audience just a brief uh, introduction of who you are. OK. Um, I'm Jeff Cakes Miller. I am a psychologist at the Martinez VA, and I direct the post-deployment assessment and treatment program. Thank you so much for yeah. being here tonight. Thanks. JT. Sure. JTB Cool. I'm a readjustment counselor at the Concord Vet Center down the street here. Also a prior service Marine. JT, thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. So uh, I want to start off the conversation by honoring um, that this is the second year anniversary of the tragedy that occurred at Yonville uh, with the Pathway Home Project. And uh, I, I know that the, both of you were involved in some way or another, either through relationships with those or actually on site that day. So. I uh, just want to take a moment just to um, honor the staff who were working that day and uh, to remember the, the women who were killed that day as well. Um, it's coincidental, however, that we're honoring that. Uh, it's, it's not specifically tied into the conversation, but we are talking about violence, and that was a very violent act. Um, so this is a unique opportunity to, I think, talk about something that we often overlook, I think, um, from a medical clinical perspective, we assess for these issues. We do um, screenings for homicidality, but uh, we don't, from what I've observed, I don't think we focus a lot on the conversation of preventing violence um, in the same way that we uh, address the issue of preventing suicide. And I'm just wondering why that is. Maybe you guys have perspective on that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a fair point. Suicide has prevention is I mean, rightly so receiving a lot of attention, but um, just you know violence in general is something that you know civilians and veterans alike you know certainly experience in their lives, and um, it is something that needs to be kind of assessed and talked about and made available to talk about. If I think if uh, providers aren't asking the questions. 
um, somewhere down the line, then, then it's something that can easily not ever really be brought up. Now, when we talked about this topic originally, um, it seemed that for some people it was still a little uncomfortable to address the issue of violence or homicide and such. Is, is there a stigma associated with violence and with, with the idea of someone hurting someone else? I would say so. Um, as the doctor was mentioning during an assessment and process, you have confidentiality that needs to be explained. And a lot of times the rapport and the trust isn't there when you're initially um, identifying if there are any suicidal or homicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. Of course, as part of that limit of confidentiality is saying, if, if you are gonna leave this place, that I have uh, an obligation to report and bring somebody in to ensure that it does not. Mm -hmm. And so uh, clinicians sometimes will not be comfortable with saying, look, there's a point where I might have to stop this conversation and breach confidentiality. Mm -hmm. But I wanna ensure that as we're sitting here, if any of these thoughts come up, this is definitely the place to bring them because we wanna work with these thoughts, we wanna move you away from them and put a plan into motion where it protects you and the other people that might be at the receiving end of these thoughts. So I wanna remind our audience, tonight we're talking about preventing violence. A very difficult conversation. Maybe you're wondering why we're talking about this. Obviously, violence occurs in any community. Uh, this is not specifically a veteran topic, but we'd love to hear from you. We know you're watching out there tonight. If you have a question or a comment, uh, you can reach us by Facebook, or you can call us here in the studio. We'd love to take your call. Phone lines are open right now. Is there a specific profile you think that violence affects? Is there, um, you know, I know that maybe someone who is suicidal may be experiencing substance abuse or maybe experiencing depression, or maybe that's not even the correct profile. Is there, is there a profile that we associate with someone who may be at risk of of violence? Well, I can, I can um, offer some that I know of. For sure, just exposure as a child, you know, even that's a big, a big risk factor for the potential of later having both be a victim as well as maybe someone who does some, you know, impulsive things under stress. And certainly stress, financial issues, um, relationship stressors, things that can affect people that can really get them really upset and thinking that there's less, less opportunities how to deal with it are a little bit more you know, prone to have um, the potential to act out in a way that they wouldn't normally or want to. I would agree with that when it comes to uh, the profile per se, that there's emotional regulation and a lack thereof. So impulsivity plays a role in that. Uh, but I think also there's the dynamic of being uh, misunderstood or not accepted. Okay. And really for the individual uh, that starts intrinsically with that uh, self-worth and knowing who the person is, a lot of times that's an exploration within um, therapy is finding out who am I, uh, especially if I've worked outside of my value system. And the concern uh, at the Concord Vet Center, we do readjustment counseling. It's coming from the military into civilian life. And so there's that adjusting of who I was trained to be, who I identified with prior to, and who I am now and how the world sees me. So uh, that within the veteran lens, um, that, that disconnect is do I understand, do I accept who I am? Do I have others that are able to also come alongside me as I'm dealing with some of these struggles? And unfortunately, what we've seen um, when there's violence is that there hasn't been that alliance. There's a feeling of not being understood and there's that lack of support and uh, a lot of times isolation and from that a lot of fear. Mm. Have you guys had the experience as we're talking about lack of support? So we know that for you guys specifically, because you you deal with veterans mostly, mm -hmm. but um, maybe the family members or friends or whoever may um, actually escort them to their appointments or even to the vet center. Have you had any um, interactions with those members that have maybe expressed concern on behalf of the veteran or? Yeah, that that certainly can be a very useful yeah. uh, useful way to go about. But obviously, it takes the consent of the, right. the 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 patient, so to speak, which is usually our veterans, that they are open to having that um, conversation. And when they are, um, it can still be a difficult 
you know, topic to bring up at times and is it safe to talk about or what's yeah. going to happen from that? And so I think that becomes, as JT was talking about, part of the early framing of mm -hmm. what's okay to say. Right. And then if it gets to a point where, what is the point where something might have to be done? And, and once you know that, it's their choice on whether they go there and that makes it safe too. So there's no yeah. surprises. And I think, you know, it's, it's oftentimes a, a real need of, of kind of a, a common communication that doesn't exist right now that I think is one mm -hmm. of the things that um, we spend a lot of time with in trying to help put words to some of those feelings and some of that distress that they um, oftentimes don't know exactly how to communicate. Yeah. And that makes it just build all the more. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I kind of back to what you were saying with them just trying to maneuver through who they were prior to maybe their service and then what they were asked to do during service and then now kind of post-service life um, and identifying who the core of them are, who are they now? Um, are they still connected to the person they were prior to whatever you know their service was? So I guess in that lane, um, what are some of the challenges that you've seen with that part, like just getting back to their identity? <clears throat> I would say there's a, a lot that's wrapped up in shame. Um, when you have a violent thought, that's something that you wouldn't want anybody else to see. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh, and talking about it exposes you to uh, additional risks of, will I be accepted? Yeah. Will I be judged? Yeah. Right? And so addressing the shame that's involved in this whole thought process that, you know, violence in itself is, it's an outward behavior of anger. And a lot of times that anger is driven by fear. Mm -hmm. It's a protective feature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think addressing that shame that, look, uh, although you might be having these thoughts, that doesn't mean that this is something that you're going to do. This doesn't define who you are as a person. Yeah. Let's go ahead and explore what these thoughts mean to you. Yeah. And I would just say prior, you know, you were asking about, you know, contributions to what might become a violent uh, incident is also then the, you know, substance abuse can certainly play in as it helps with, um, maybe initially feeling more, you know, better, right. but then the disinhibition and then some of the really impulsive things that can happen with, you know, what was meant to be kind of some self, mm -hmm. self-soothing self kind of attempt is, is a big problem. Um, so that that's an, a, a more common issue uh, associated that needs to be kind of assessed as part of the overall yeah. picture. So in, in regards to how this manifests, how it leads from a lack of identity or communication and becomes about shame of not being able to share this with others, does it quickly manifest into something that reaches a point of violence or do you, do you find that this builds over a period of time in which someone manifests maybe a plan like they would for something like suicide? I could say just from my own personal exposure to violence when it comes to being a clinician and working with uh, the clients, that gen generally it's an impulsive act. It's not that there's been a plan to hurt somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, if there's the intrusive thoughts of homicide um, towards another person, generally it's, it's based on an experience and action and they're just working through how do I protect myself and what was behind this. Um, Unfortunately, those that are, are talking about these thoughts are the ones that are least likely to act upon them. And so it's when somebody does not engage in this conversation that we really have to be observing for those other markers. Are they pulling away from their supportive network? Are they relying on uh, drugs or alcohol as a soothing mechanism rather than maybe relationships, which would be a supporting you know, factor? So. Uh, those that are, are talking about the thoughts, I think, are the ones that uh, give us the greatest insight into what we can do to support somebody who uh, is less likely to, to resource and to follow along with uh, a safety plan. But when we're talking about prevention, I think our greatest source of prevention is um, looking at what works well within those that, that do address mm -hmm. violence and, and violent thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, we received a question. I want to acknowledge that, but I'm going to save this question for a future segment. Um, I, I, I think that we have maybe through recent events that have occurred have built um, a certain impression that this has become a more violent um, culture or community. Do you feel that there's more room 
here to improve in terms of the clinical world or in terms of a community in understanding violence and learning how to prevent it? Or do you feel like we have a good grasp on this and, the, and we're just getting a little bit more exposure to it because of media? I, I, I think certainly it's the, the, the immediate immediacy of the media now certainly can and, and how it can just be spun off in lots of ways. It sometimes gives maybe a little bit of a false impression mm -hmm. of some of the ways. Certainly it's an issue that in it, you don't have to be a veteran to have obviously experienced. It's a common, a more common problem in our societies and what we want to have um, you know, around. And what we have to do is have the discussion as we are now yeah. talking about it and providers asking the questions yeah. just as uniformly and casually as you would all of the other parts just to kind of make it an available space to talk about. Yeah. I think I end up finding out, I mean, I think as many veterans have discussed what might be the beginning of their own concerns because it's affecting their kids, mm -hmm. you know, and they, where they wouldn't do it for themselves necessarily. Mm -hmm. right. they're, they're seeing something in their kids that are letting them know that I don't want this, you know, to continue and yeah. infect them. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. We'll actually have you both on as guests in future segments. So, uh, but we've got this conversation started. I'm looking forward to the rest of the show. When we come back, we will be talking with veteran and filmmaker Brian Hamilton. And later tonight, we'll be talking with an expert on domestic violence from Stand and Brandon Correa, a CHP officer. So stay tuned. We will be right back after this message from the 2020 Census. How will 2020 Census data be used? Where there are more people, there are more needs for public services. That's why the Census is used by the government to inform funding decisions each year. But that's not all. It's also used by nonprofits to inform services, by businesses to create jobs, and even by students for school projects. Understanding how the population changes helps us shape communities across the country for the better. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. Is my 2020 census data safe? After sending your census response, your personal information is kept safe. By law, it can't be shared with any other government agency, law enforcement, or landlord. No one. So take your 2020 census with peace of mind. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. Welcome back. Want to be part of our conversation? Call us right now at 925-313-1170. Our phone lines are open. We are rejoined by veteran JT B. Cool, and our next guest is veteran who is directing a short film about the effects that a violent experience had on one serviceman's life. I want to welcome Brian Hamilton to the show. Welcome. Thank you yeah. for having me. It's Thank a pleasure. You. So uh, we uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. We know we've had you on the show before, but it's always good to reintroduce yourself. Of course, of course. Uh, so my name is Brian Hamilton. Um, I'm an aspiring filmmaker. Uh, I've made a few short films now here and there, mainly with school. Um, but this is going to be my debut, like professional film. That I hope to submit to a few festivals here coming up. Huh? Yeah. Well, we are excited to have you back on the show to talk a little bit more about that and welcome back to this segment as well. So just kind of jumping right in since you've already kind of yep. led with it. Let's hear a little bit more about your, your next, your upcoming project. Okay, so this project uh, is pretty big for me. Um, but so the title right now is called The Better Part of Valor. And what this is about is about a uh, army, he's a soldier, uh, he's in the special operations unit. Um, but basically on a mission, he has to make a call whether or not he's going to kill somebody or not and he chooses not to take the shot. And so in doing so, you didn't see the ramifications of his actions. People who don't need to die are killed, and so he takes all that guilt upon himself. And so that's what the movie's about. How does he deal with that stress and guilt? And so for you, what was kind of your, um, what, what brought you to wanting to do this particular type of film? Oh, okay. Because we know you're a veteran yourself, you've yes. had a connection to service, so kind of talk about that a little bit. Okay, so I was in the Marine Corps yeah. uh, for about five years, and when I was in Okinawa, I went on a mission to the Philippines, then I went to Cambodia, then I came back to the Philippines, I went back to Okinawa. Um, and while I was in Cambodia, I went through a very, kind of very hairy situation, and it could have gone south really fast. 
And I felt the sense of hopelessness and power, powerlessness and the inability to commit violence and you know, safeguard myself if need be, mm -hmm. if, the, if it happened. But due to our discipline and the nature of the mission, we were able to get out of there with no casualties, nothing, nothing went down. So it was, really, it was actually a mission successful. Uh, but when I came back to basically garrison in Okinawa, you know, because my, my job was, uh, I was in finance, right? So when I came back, I didn't know what to talk about. I didn't know how to deal with the stress I just went through, which was I could potentially get hurt. And even though I didn't see violence itself firsthand, I did see the aftermath of it because of the situation we were in. So that really inspired me to kind of really think about my life. And so when I got out of the military, you, and this is true for every single veteran that's probably, mm -hmm. that probably got out, you feel, at first when you get out, you feel a sense of pride, okay, I did something great. But after a while, it starts to sink in that maybe you, you're like exiled. Did I make the right decision? Mm -hmm. And the reason why that comes down to is like, you feel different for everybody else. And so I started having to say like, I, one thing that's really cathartic, what I do is I tell stories. I write short stories. Mm -hmm. I, I recently got into filmmaking and I've been really pursuing that. And so what happened, this came about about a year ago, I started writing this film. And originally it was about a veteran at school and the idea of what happened to this person was very comparable to what I went through, almost a carbon copy. Yeah. But obviously you, it's hard to take reality and turn it into <laughs> a story. Things have to change. So I started changing it around uh, for the sake of the story and eventually, um, I realized it was kind of out of my depth, and that's when I got a whole started reading different books. And there are things like uh, a famous book called On Killing by Lieutenant C Colonel Grossman, and it really opened up my eyes to how we were trained in the military, how we were conditioned, and it really helped me make make this story to what it is today. Yeah. yeah so that's kind of my journey on that. Well, we know for you, you've also been in the military as well, and so just kind of you know talking with our theme for today, kind of what is your perspective from your your veteran side? Yeah, as I'm listening to uh, the crux of this narrative, it's interesting you're pointing out the moral injury not of taking a life, but uh, not taking a life, correct, and what ensued after that. Exactly. Yeah, okay. That's exactly, that's yeah. exactly the theme. I think it was inspired actually by a book I read in high school called All Quiet on the Western Front, and uh, it does not glorify war at all. And this was at a time where uh, before that war was seen as a great adventure mm -hmm. inside the uh, mind's eye. It was seen that you go to war, that's how you become a man. And mm -hmm. still in a lot of ways, it's kind of true. It's a rite of passage for some people, but at least enter the military. Uh, but war is a very different thing, especially nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nowadays, we're not fighting conventional warfare necessarily. We still train for it, of course, mm -hmm. but we're fighting insurgency. And that's a whole, this kind of warm that, uh, worms out of, uh, on its own. Um, and that's also something that I deal with as a kind of a theme is how do you fight an insurgency? How do you deal with a population that is hostile and trying to kill you? And how does that make you feel? Yeah. You know, what do you do? You know, what if your target, the person you're trying to kill, is not some evil man mm -hmm. with a uniform and a weapon, but it's a woman? What do you do? And so that's what I deal with, right? So he doesn't take the shot, for instance, and thus what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you have interviewed veterans in this process, I guess, in, in building this film. So I would imagine veterans have either shared about experiences that they've engaged in, in which violence occurred, mm -hmm. or maybe have shared some of their own thoughts and feelings about violence. What, what, what generally do you find happens when you approach veterans on the topic of violence? Are they very guarded about it? Um, are they ready to share if someone really is listening and seems to be tuned in, or what do you find? That's, that's a great question. Um, so here's my experience. So because the people I talked to knew I was a veteran already, they were much more open with me about what was going on, especially knew what kind of person I was, and we would exchange stories a little bit. So they knew I was coming from a place of respect, right? And I think that's a major thing. Um, but, you know, a couple of people I actually interviewed because I wanted soldiers to play uh, the soldiers in the movie, right? I didn't want someone who wasn't a soldier, you know? mainly for many reasons, trigger discipline, just awareness, the, the look. Um, but I, or when I was talking to people who would play like kind of the, the veteran soldiers in the unit, people who had been down range before, or people who had been in combat. And one thing I really want to talk to them about was just like, what did you, what did you feel? What did you experience? What happened? And the stories told me like they were very, it was very confusing for them. You know, just to kind of give a quick synopsis, a quick snapshot of what they would talk about. They would say things like, it happened so fast, yeah. you know? Uh, we just, we were, we were reacting. Uh, we, we didn't expect this to go down this way or where it was, but they were still ready to kill. They were still ready to fight. It was just, there was no one around, for instance. One story I heard is an IED went off, right? They were attacked, but they, were, they couldn't find the enemy. So they were just sitting there calling in a medevac, you know? 
that was his combat experience. He didn't even do anything. So the fact I told the story where it's not about shooting somebody, it's about not shooting somebody, mm -hmm. that's also something that really opened them up about talking because they realized, oh, you know something different about it. You're not just trying to make an action film. Mm -hmm. trying to make a film about violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when, when they describe this, this act of violence or this yeah. lack of violence and such, I hear there's, there's, there's some, almost some, um, I guess, removal of the sense of self. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to describe this, but do people describe that they feel more empowered or they feel more in control? Oh. Or do they feel that they have somewhat of a dis disassociation uh, with, with who they are or, or what they're experiencing? Uh, there's actually a sense, so I talked to a couple of people who said they actually engaged somebody and then killed them. And uh, again, this is kind of a macabre topic, but we're talking about it, right? Yep. And so one thing that he said is that he had a sense of euphoria. And this is something that I got from Lieutenant Colonel Grossman's book. There was a sense of pride in the achievement of what they did. They did their job, they did what they were trained to do, and they executed it, they safeguarded the brothers. It wasn't until afterwards they started thinking about it that they approached the now body of the enemy that started to sink in what actually went down. Mm -hmm. And then there's something that happened, this, uh, this is something I gathered from the book, and I did talk to him about what I was reading, and this also kind of helped too. I talked about the purification process, which is something that Lieutenant Colonel Grossman talks about. Um, the idea that you come back to society, and society then says, you did something good. We still love you, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a very important thing. We do it in the military, we give medals out, that's one great example. Mm -hmm. uh, but also one thing that's healing is telling stories. And so when he was telling a story, and I was relating with him, and I said, this, this is why I want to work with you on the story, because I can see in your eyes, this is what you dealt with. I wanted you to bring it to the table. That was also another part of the healing process. Yeah. Yeah. But to answer your question, sense of euphoria, sense mm -hmm. of achievement, and then afterward comes the guilt. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to acknowledge we've got a question from our audience, and thank you for your participation in tonight's conversation. Uh, was the transition out of the military harder than you anticipated? So that can be for either of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you have several Marines sitting at the you table. Do. And so as a readjustment <laughs> counselor, I could say that sometimes Marines are the most difficult because within our, our ethos and our uh, identity, they say once a Marine, always a Marine. Hmm. And there are certain things that are um, just ingrained in that. But from uh, just the military perspective and a veteran coming out of it, um, yeah, I think the, the biggest transition for me and that I've seen in others is that there's a defined sense of purpose, value, based in who you are, your rank structure, your uniform, your camaraderie, and then they give you mission. Mm. All the guesswork's taken out of it. Mm -hmm. And so coming into civilian life uh, is redefining, okay, who am I, am, who am I and what is my mission? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that identity piece that we kind of talked about in the right. last segment of trying to connect who was I beforehand, right. during, and now after, and how do those, how does that one person <laughs> connect with all three of those different time periods in their life. How about you for your transition? Oh man, yeah. No, it, it, like I was talking about, you, you feel like you're uh, exiled, self-imposed exiled sometimes, hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, when you get out with an honorable discharge or whatever. Um, and you have to kind of like reconnect with yourself. You know, one thing that helped me is that I joined a veterans club at my, at my college and that really helped me yeah. uh, just connect with other people who are like-minded because you do feel that there is something different about you. Yeah. Right? So it's a purpose, it's a mission that you talked about, um, sense of drive, but also one thing that's very key is that we were trained to engage in violence against an enemy. And a lot of this behavioralism, you know, we just see a target, you shoot a target, right? It goes back down, right? You see the body drop. And then you, you know, let's say you don't engage in violence like myself. What do you feel like? Do you feel like, oh, I didn't do my job? Yeah. Right, you feel a sense of guilt. But the one thing across the board is that you do feel guilt at some level. I either didn't do enough or I, I did too much, right. right, and I'm scarred for life. Right. Um, but I also learned one thing too is that um, at the end of the day, it's like veterans understand each other. Yeah, right, absolutely. Right, but we can't also use that as a, a crux or a crutch. I, I should I should say uh, not to engage with other people who don't understand. Right. In fact, you, it should be uh, something that you should do. Right, is to engage people who don't understand uh, veterans community or the military at all. You should engage more and educate people on it too. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of educating, how, how important do you think that film is in getting this message out about violence and the prevention of it? Having more of a conversation about how this is something that we need to learn more about and talk more about um, and possibly reduce somewhat of the stigma associated with it, that yeah. um, 
you know, that, that fear that you described earlier or the, what's the term that you used? Shame. Mm-hmm. Shame. Uh, and, and really getting out that message that, you know, the, the fear of shame or not wanting to be shameful can really hold someone back from expressing this, uh, this very real, um, I guess, drive towards violence inside. Well, as a filmmaker and as a storyteller, I think it really comes down to how you portray the violence, right? So the sense of euphoria I was talking about is definitely um, uh, done in all types of movies. You see it, uh, for instance, Game of Thrones, right? This idea of hyper violence, right? And it's not real. It's for movies, right? But that's the way it's presented as action, as something fun, as glorious, Mm -hmm. right? And then you have movies that are about war. And usually those movies, especially about Vietnam and, you know, afterwards because of Vietnam. Big battles. Yeah, big battles, very violent battles, very bloody battles. Um, and so it's really important to understand the distinction between action and violence. But here's the thing. The thing, it, it isn't a problem for adults usually, and it shouldn't be a problem for adults to differentiate between the two. But for children it is because for them it might be all the same. So we're conditioning young people mm-hmm. to think that certain things are realistic when they're not. We give them false expectations. And... For instance, if you're a young boy or young girl, it doesn't matter, and you go out, you grow up hunting and you shoot like little animals, you know that you're killing them, mm-hmm. right? Where, in, for instance, in video games or movies or television, you see something happening, like, oh, that's what it, that's the definition of a man. That's what I that'd be be a master of violence, yeah. but it's not real violence. It's just a master of action, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost well, a romance with violence. Almost a yeah. romance with it. Mm-hmm. Well said. Well, gentlemen, we're out of time. But thanks so much, Brian, and thanks for Thank sticking you. around, JT. Sure Um, We'll talk more about this. After the break, we will return with domestic violence expert Rhonda James and a CHP officer will discuss road rage. They will be available to take your live questions. So call us right now at 925-313-1170. Can one girl in a small town, an architect in a major city, and a suburban high school coach shape the future of the United States? Yes, they can. Because every 10 years, the census gives us that power. You can shape your future by responding to the 2020 census. Where do we need new roads to make our lives easier? Where will new school programs help our children thrive? Where could a new health clinic benefit neighborhoods? The 2020 census will inform these decisions and shape how billions of dollars will be distributed to communities like yours each year. And in 2020, you can respond to the census online, by phone, or by mail. It's easy, safe, and important. Make sure you and everyone you know is counted. Now is the time for you to get involved. Your community needs you. Together, we can educate and excite, inspire and make sure every voice is heard. Together, we can shape our future. Welcome back. We're talking about violence prevention. What an important topic this is. We want to welcome you to contact us with your questions. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One or email us at Veterans Voices at ContraCostaTV.org. Or you can reach us by phone at 925 313 1170. In fact, we've had a couple of questions. We had a question that came up during the first segment. I'd like to call that back up. And we'll address that during this segment. Uh, But before we get there, our guests are Rhonda James with Stand for Families Free of Domestic Violence and Brandon Correa with the California Highway Patrol. And, of course, Dr. Kixmiller has returned to this panel and joined us for another part of the discussion. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. you. So before we get into this conversation, just a brief uh, further introduction of yourself, Rhonda. Great. I'm the CEO for STAND for Families Free of Violence, and we're the shelter-based domestic violence services organization for Contra Costa County. We're able to provide prevention, intervention, and actually a great deal of uh, treatment and services for those who've harmed as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, Officer Brandon Correa with CHP. I'm a public information officer. I really love my job, first of all, and thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it to give us a voice and participate with veterans, and I'm also a prior Marine. Prior service Marine. Thank you. You're right. Okay, so uh, we've been talking about violence, mostly from a, the perspective of trying to understand violence and really uh, turning the conversation towards preventing violence. So we had a question earlier that I want to relate to this 
group in hopes that we can get an answer to this, because this is, I think, a question most people think about. Has our society become more violent? Children did not always have active shooter drills. I remember growing up and not having active shooter drills. So, um, but I think, you know, I think the public's perception is that this has become a more violent culture. But is, is that true? Do the statistics reflect that? Does, does the need for resources reflect that? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I have a, a really big opinion about that. I absolutely okay. think we're living in a world that's become more violent and more sophisticated in its violence. Violence is more pervasive, and we talk about it in a more social in more social channels. So all of those things are true. And access to ways to be violent have increased. Um, and most of the social science tells us that we're seeing increased violent episodes within families and within communities. And it's related to exposure and saturation mm. and learned behavior. Yes. Exposure, saturation, and learned behavior. Give us, give our audience a little bit better understanding of that. What's the saturation that's occurring? So one of the things we know in terms of, of, of early uh, exposure and saturation, we know that children exposed to domestic violence or other kinds of community violence are much more likely to think of that as an option and to also have those post-traumatic responses, have maybe not learned some of the other coping skills, have not made decisions early on, and are frankly are, are, are emulating um, those around them they care about and those with whom they're attached. So we know that, for instance, young boys are much more likely to, to perpetrate violence against a partner later on if they see their mothers abused than if they themselves were abused. And we see that over and over again. We also know there's so many youth who never perpetrate violence, but really coming up with what the differences are between those populations is really the work of mental health. Interesting. And are you, are you seeing this in region? We, we broke this down somewhat in terms of resources that address issues of violence of people that you know and people you don't know. And so we're looking at the perspective here of violence that occurs on the roadway, road, categorized as commonly road rage and such, and other, other acts. Um, are you guys, are you guys, is CHP or other law enforcement agencies seeing an increase in, in the complexity of violence as well? I don't know if it's seeing an increase per se, but. I think you can boil it down to um, the lack of just respect people have for each other. Yeah. Very simply, common courtesy on the road, whether the population is just so enormous and then now there's a mixture of, you know, it's glorified on TV of different things that are happening. It's so easy to see horrible behaviors all the time and then emulate the same thing. Have people just lost respect for each other? Because it seems like a lot of that could be could be fixed if you do very, very, very simple things for common courtesies. And then specific tactics I can talk about too with specific things you could do to prevent uh, a road rage incident or an aggressive driver or de-escalate. That's a good word to use. <laughs> Let's talk about that because I, I mean, personally, I experience a lot of this. I'd say, I, I, you know, it's that, it's that Prius that cuts in front of me. <laughs> it's that big Chevy truck that's on my rear end. And, uh, you know, the, I think the thing that's worked well for me, because I think it's gotten to a point that it's, it's gotten really intense. Um, but the thing that's worked for me so far is that I tell myself, if I, never, if I let this car go past me, I'll never see it again. Brilliant. Maybe I'll maybe I'll see that car again, but but at this point it's always worked. So what what are the strategies here to preventing violence, either in the house with someone you know, a loved one, or in places out in the community with people you you you've never encountered before? They've done that thing that just uh, got you, and maybe you'll never see them again. Well, I, I think a lot of planning needs to go into pre-thinking. So deciding that that's not an option for you, that to decide how I communicate and how I interact with, with people doesn't involve hitting really early on is a big decision. And then also know, notice what my moments of peril are. So there are certain things that happen or certain things people say or look at me or drive a certain way that are going to create a certain experience for myself. So to anticipate that and to have kind of lock that in first so I have options. I like what you're doing. Well, I'll never see them again. I say to myself, it's really not about me. You know, most things aren't about me. So certainly this, this other person's driving behavior or this person's uh, violence. So really making the decision ahead of time now, we had a question that was just up a second ago, and I want, I want to bring that question back up here because we have a question that asks whether mandatory training should be um, offered to children. And then we also have a culture that really loves UFC and boxing <laughs> um, 
And so how do we blend that together? You know, wrestling and such, you know, when, when people are, are struggling to establish dominance over each other, I mean, wrestling is a school sport, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how, how do we blend that together with people asking questions about, shouldn't we have mandatory training for children? But yet at the same time, I'm gonna take my kid to uh, a UFC fight or a boxing fight mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'll expose them to the idea that we can even assign points and score and, mm -hmm. and winners to mm -hmm. the idea that someone was able to be more violent to the other person. Mm -hmm. Well, well, there's healthy conflict, and I yeah, think all of us like a certain amount of healthy conflict, and I, I can pass it off to others as well. But I think it's really unpacking in that kind of relationship-based conversation about what you're experiencing. Yeah. And I think there are some, some youth and some kids who maybe should be directed in one way or another or have uh, the effects of violence unpacked uh, with the caregiver more readily. Not just kind of thrown into, you know, you're a kid who likes who likes those things, yeah. so let's do it. But really having someone who loves them explain it and also n not vilify it. There's a time and a place for aggression yeah. and for physical activity. Mm. That, that's, that's, mm. It's not the antithesis of that. But as you said, the modeling that so many people work off is what they saw right. very early on. Right. So if that's what they saw, that's what they know, that's even okay, or it's not you know, something that they think is out of necessarily the ordinary. So when they become to see some outcomes of some of this, that's where it really needs to be kind of addressed and, you know, acknowledged and then hopefully the conversations start, you know, and, and a lot of times this can go into secrecy mode mm -hmm. and hiding it and that's what kind of propels it on from being addressed in a more forward way. So I think I think you're all right. It's it's society has that all out there and we have to kind of start early with helping our children understand some of the differences like they were just saying in the violence in the movies in the prior the prior section about how to and you need kind of that conversation going along to help children early on start mm -hmm. realizing what mm -hmm. what they're seeing and what's real and what's you know for tv and those kind of things and empathy training too yeah. you know really understanding what the other person is experiencing mm -hmm. um, what we see a lot with domestic violence is those folks who've done harm don't necessarily use harm in other relationships mm -hmm. they've made a choice to not not use harm in their intimate mm -hmm. partner yeah. relationships so. uh, i wanted to add one point to uh, the the specific question of like you know uh fighting or boxing or mma or ufc I think the majority, the very highest percentage of professional UFC fighters or MMA fighters are that, professionals. Mm -hmm. And they know when, and, and very, very respectful yeah. of all the rules and different religions and different people. And it's like, you know, everything is the 5% or the 10% give mm -hmm. like the worst case scenario <laughs> yeah. for everybody else. Yeah. So it's like, you even take it further back with you, if you grew up and your father is a UFC fighter or a fighter or a boxer, it's like, if you have those set of values in place, of mm -hmm. uh, this is how you act respectful in the workplace to others around you, this is how you treat people, but this is what we do to train in the gym, or this is what we do for our sport or our livelihood or whatever it is, then you're 100% on the right path, mm -hmm. and you'll fall into that mm -hmm. respecting ev everybody yeah. in general, um, which will apply on the roadway as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a ton of things I could talk about on the road with that, but in a moment, I, maybe I'll give a couple simple, <laughs> simple things that people will remember without talking too much um, yeah. about things you could do on the road just to, you know, de-escalate and, and push things away and avoid a possible circumstance. Yeah, give us some examples. Yeah. I mean, that, use me as a scenario. You know, I'm on Highway 4 so, and, Nathan's you know, it's driving 5 o'clock. The silver what do Prius. I do? And, uh, it's, a, it's a white Nissan Leaf, as a matter of fact. White story. Nissan <laughs> Leaf with the nice little leaf on the back. And he's just minding his own business, listening to Miley Cyrus, driving down the road. <laughs> yeah. And you have somebody that's starting to be aggressive. You know, whatever you think that is, they're tailgating you, they're cutting you off, they're not allowing you to pass. The important thing is like what is imp like when what is important right now is probably to get home and be safe with your family. Yeah. So if you can figure out like you were saying earlier about uh, letting it go and like making that decision before you even leave, probably <laughs> early in your life, mm -hmm. have some humility. Like okay, just I'm gonna let that go. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work out like that, then there's other things. You made a point earlier, exiting. <laughs> Separate yourself with distance, yeah. especially if someone's in front of you. You don't know how many times we get phone calls. This has been going on for 12 miles. Why haven't you exited? 
get <laughs> off, get away from what's. Yes. You wouldn't go in a convenience store if there was a yeah. person with a weapon True. wielding a knife. You, you you would get away from the danger, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing on the roadway. Get away from the danger. If you cannot, don't make eye contact. Yeah. Don't provoke somebody. Don't give mm -hmm. hand gestures of whatever it is. But if you have to call 911 or you have a passenger, do that, uh, and specifically give what roadway are you on, which direction you're traveling, and what's the next exit. Then we can pinpoint your location. That's awesome. And then what you saw. Yeah. A white Nissan Leaf yeah. with a gentleman in a blue shirt, you know, yeah. giving me the you want. Cyrus. We have just another minute, but real quickly here, comment from our audience, is speeding a form of violence? Is it a form of aggression? Are there, are there certain things that people tend to do, like speed, mm -hmm. when they have higher levels of aggression and maybe a preponderance or susceptibility, I should say, to violence? We have one minute. Really quick, uh, of course, that, that's, that's possible. Your, your emotions are part of who you are. So if you leave the house and you were just spun up about my husband did this or my wife did this and you, that's your attitude now behind the wheel, who knows what's gonna happen? I don't know who you are as a person before you get behind the wheel. So that's possible and, and your vehicle is a weapon. So if anybody got in a crash before, a DUI crash, or you hurt or killed somebody, yeah. that will be presented in court. Your vehicle is a weapon, so, yeah. mm, of course. I want to take 30 seconds to talk about weapons, as a matter of fact. I have somewhat of a viewpoint that it's someone recognizing that they are feeling violent, that the weapons that they have in home should be removed from the home and maybe put in the safety of someone else. What's the best thing that, that someone can do uh, when they feel like those weapons are more of a risk to their family than they were intended mm -hmm. to, to help? About, about five seconds here. Well, you also see it in the suicide prevention literature and, and the research that you limit access to lethal means, and it's often not even just firearms. We know that people hurt themselves and others with other kinds of weapons. But when people are vulnerable in some way to have someone who cares about them, to limit access. Okay, so hand them off to a good friend, something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, someone trustworthy, you don't have to necessarily get rid of them, but mm -hmm. they're not there when you're really feeling, you know, kind of in that risky place. Yeah. Right. Great. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this conversation. We talked and covered a lot. I wish we could have had more time for this very important conversation. Before we leave you tonight, we want you to hear A Veteran's Voice, our monthly segment that tells a veteran's story in their own words. Enjoy. Welcome to A Veteran's Voice. Today we have with us uh, Brad Gallup, Marine, and retired Air Force Major. No. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Glad to have me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And this is actually your second time here. You were here in September 2018 for an episode? Yep. Yes. They're working with, we had uh, two other facilitators that were doing equine work, working with veterans and first responders. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, welcome back then. Yeah, thank you. Great to be back. So maybe uh, we could start out a little bit about your um, military history, some experiences that you had in the military. Yeah, I grew up just outside of Detroit and uh, in Michigan, and in, at 18 joined the Marine Corps. I figured I wanted to go to college, and right then it was the Vietnam War was just ending, so I decided to come in and look for my GI Bill. So I spent four years in the Corps, um, and then I ended up getting out. I wanted to transfer to aircraft maintenance, and they wouldn't let me, so I got out, got my degree, worked for three years, and then. I just had this epiphany. I wanted to go back in the military. So I went back in the Air Force. They gave me aircraft maintenance as an officer, and I did that nice. for 17 years. Nice. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And after you uh, left the Air Force, where did you head? Ended up, uh, while I was still in, I ended up starting doing uh, some grief work, working with um, military families with an organization called TAPS. Yeah. <clears throat> which is Strategy Assistant Program for Survivors. And, um, and I really found that because of my own grief work, I was doing my own personal work at the time, because um, I really, after I came back from the first Gulf War, I was really struggling and uh, almost took my life. <clears throat> so I ended up going downtown and uh, seeing a therapist and uh, didn't let the Air Force know, yeah. but uh, I didn't want to lose my top secret clearance, so I started doing my own personal work. And, and then I came across this grief work that they were doing military families out of TAPS. And so I went off and got certified as a grief facilitator. And during that time, I had an amazing equine experience um, down in Tucson, Arizona. That changed my life. Maybe you could share a little bit about right now what uh, your ranch, a little bit about. Uh... Yeah, I've been very blessed. Um, uh, I, 
I started, I got certified back in uh, 2013 on doing equine guided education with uh, my teacher, Ariana Strauzzi, mm. who lives up in uh, Bodega yeah. um, and here in California. But I've been kind of looking at horse work for the last, you know, probably been the, about the 15 years before that. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up getting certified uh, and I really found that I loved the work. Mm -hmm. um, and so ended up doing some own personal work on my own, doing some work with some other nonprofits. And then two years ago, I got a call from an organization called Save a Warrior. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were looking for a um, uh, equine facilitator uh, during their five and a half day long war detox program they put on. So they were doing it at the time in Malibu. And uh, so I went down and started doing their, helping with their equine day. Mm -hmm. Um, that led to me, ended up sitting in the seat as a witness going through, um, which of course nobody's a witness. Everybody goes yeah, through the program. Right. It's just a little formality to get people in. But mm -hmm. uh, in June of 2018, and then I started doing more and more. So um, at the same time, uh, I had bought a ranch probably uh, just before that in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And then um, I ended up meeting a woman here from Oakland, and uh, we started having a relationship, and uh, I ended up moving out to California. We bought a ranch uh, by about two and a half hours north of the bay in a little town called Kelseyville, mm -hmm. California, yeah. um, outside of uh, Clear Lake. And so we've got a ranch that we're putting together slowly but surely there. And at the same time, I'm now uh, one of the main facilitators for the West Coast team for Save a Warrior. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Maybe you could share a little bit more about uh, Save a Warrior in addition to the eCoin. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's been around for seven years. Um, Jake Clark um, founded this, created this program as a way to be able to help with the suicide epidemic that's going on for first responders and veterans. Yeah. Um, so it's a... Uh, innovative, where it spins off novelty. It's kind of worked off the hero's journey, off the hero's journey of Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's different segments in there, but uh, in the five and a half days work, there's, uh, we teach warrior meditation. We teach mindfulness. We also do a high ropes challenge program. And then we do a full day of equine. What Sable Warrior does beautifully is that we pull the moral injury off of the pre-trauma and actually allow the pre-trauma to be pulled away and then and through ritual work actually allow it to be uh, burned away in a sense. Okay. And uh, it becomes a transformative experience for so the men and women that go through the program. Then of course yeah. my wife and I, my wife Julie and I are setting up our own ranch up there in Kelseyville yeah. in which you've come up and yes. actually been up and you've seen our place. Tremendous, and, yes. And spend a day with us and the horses. Yes. And um, in addition to veterans, it's also open to first responders. Yes, yeah, first responders. Yep, first responders. Yep. So you know anybody that's in the uh, police, firefighters, EMTs. Wonderful. Um, we have some work with some people in the medical that are working with trauma. Mm -hmm. um, we just know that uh, with all the emphasis that's been placed on the warriors, this you know, 20 uh, veterans per day killing themselves yeah. in the country. Yeah. Now all of a sudden it's being turned to first responders and we're seeing that there's, a, this, there's an incredible rise going on of suicide yeah. in, with firefighters and uh, police officers across the country. And so we're able to work with both that. And we find that it doesn't matter when we put firefighters, police officers and warriors together. Yeah. It's, uh, they're all being of service. They've all seen trauma or moral injury. And uh, yeah, it just ends up being a very powerful experience for everybody involved. Yeah. And for a lot of men, sometimes it's a wife that basically reaches out and uh, basically says they need help. My husband needs help. We don't know what to do. Yeah. And so we get him, and then we end up getting him in the seat, as we say, and yeah. have him go through the program. And it is the, uh, I know you call them cohorts, or the cohort, women cohort. Are female veteran cohorts growing as well in, in number? Yeah, we've, they were going to do, uh, I think we'd do a seven this year. Um, mm -hmm. Last year we did four or five, five. Yeah, and so we're growing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's just being able to find, we're trying to grow our facilities and staff to be able to handle that because we mm -hmm. just do men 
all together by themselves, and then we do women, yeah. run them separate, so we run them separate. And for the men, it's more of an initiation, um, a true initiation instead of what we can kind of consider um, uh, a pseudo initiation going into the military, going through boot camp, going through those different things is actually, we get called to that being of service through that initiation. Wonderful. A anything else coming down the plate? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, uh, we're um, very excited about, you know, being able to um, have both the East Coast and West Coast yeah. team. We're also going to have an alumni event. Uh, we had one last year in Ohio, and we had 100 people for that. And this oh, year goodness. we're hoping for about 300. Um, but we're really starting to get the VA starting to really get a notice of us. We're working very close with the Ohio VA. It's very interested in what we're doing out there for Sable Warrior. Um, and we're really working on starting to work with firefighter unions to be able to help us pay for the seat going in. It doesn't cost wow. anybody to come through. Um, all we do is ask them to put their plane, pay for their plane ticket. Yeah. Um, but we really, it's 2,500 per person to run somebody through the program. So it started out when Jake started out seven years ago, it was 5,000. And so we've been able to shrink that down, becoming more efficient um, and helping with donations. But it's still a cost. Yeah, and uh, so we're looking to raise $2 million this year to be able to cover those costs and our growing need for what we got out there in the, in the community. Well, <laughs> we look forward to seeing how the year goes. And thank you so much, Brad, for coming and sharing all your work and your passion yeah. with us. Thank you. Yeah, okay. we're very excited about what we're doing and uh, we're just excited to be able to get the word out. So thank you for having me on to put the word. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that episode of A Veteran's Voice. And thank you for tuning in to the show tonight. We hope you enjoyed this very important discussion. If you or someone you know are dealing with violent thoughts or feelings, there is help available. There is no shame in this. The Veterans Crisis Line offers someone to talk to 24 hours a day. You can reach them at veteranscrisisline.net or call 1-800-273-8255 and press 1. STAND for Families Free of Violence is dedicated to helping those caught in the cycle of violence. They can be reached, they can be reached at 1-888-215-5555. Save a Warrior understands the issues our warriors and veterans face. It is their mission to save lives in the veterans community. Find them at savealwarrior.org. Veterans Voices is brought to you in part by contributions from the 2020 Census. Now more than ever, it is important for veterans to stand up and be counted. The Veterans Affordable Home Program, serving those who have served us, ensuring the American dream for our veterans, and the Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation, dedicated to helping veterans near you. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider's schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also rewatch this episode and many others on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa. So be sure to subscribe. We will talk about homelessness in our next show on Monday, April 13th at 7 o'clock. All, show, all live shows have moved to the second Monday of the month. We used to be on the third Monday. Now we're on the second Monday. Ratings have gotten better, right? Yes. Be sure to tune in. I'd like to thank our hardworking CCTV production team for all of their work. From our whole family here at Veterans Voices, thank you for watching and have a great evening.